Hey everybody, welcome to Life is Brutiful, and today we're going to be doing another episode of This Week in Beer, the segment on my channel where we go through and we talk about some of the biggest, hardest hitting news stories coming out of the beer industry, beer culture, brewing, brewing culture that came out this week. Now this week was rather slow, nothing too crazy or too hard hitting, just a lot of really random and really weird things happening around the globe. And I kind of just want to run through them real quick, so let's go ahead and jump into it. First up, we have a very weird story coming out of Indian brewing scene. Not, not Indiana, like actual India, the country, you know. The entity that regulates food, health, and regulations and stuff like that in India has decided that they are going to try to restrict and limit the use of yeast in beer. According to a new law that's going to come into effect on April 1st, 2019, the government agency is going to try to decrease the amount of yeast and mold contaminants found in beer, which doesn't sound like such a bad thing on its face. Sometimes I do think there needs to be a little bit of government regulation in order to maintain health safety for the population. It's, you know, I don't, I don't like it when it's overbearing, but a little bit, you know, it's a good thing. However, the problem with this is that the law isn't going to stipulate the fact that yeast is a critical component of beer and it kind of has to be there for it to be beer and instead it's just going to overall list it as a contaminant. And this law is really, really going to impact the burgeoning craft beer scene that we're seeing coming out of India. Over the past 10 years, they've expanded from literally 10 breweries or microbreweries as they prefer to call them to well over 170. And these microbrewers, they're, they're coming out and they're saying this law is going to hugely impact us because it is going to be almost impossible for them to comply with it. And I'm not going to lie, the standards do seem pretty insane. For a bottled or canned beer, there has to be zero yeast per parts per million. That's like, that's 100% clear, ultimate, pasteurized and purified. And as you know, most craft brewers don't have that or don't practice that. It's an expense that they usually aren't able to, you know, afford and, you know, it kind of gets rid of a little bit of the authentic, real and natural aspects of it. Additionally, if you were going to sell your beer on draft or in some other type of keg format, it has to have no more than 40 CFU, which is almost nothing. It's almost, it's literally it's literally just about one or two steps above nothing. This new law is practically going to prohibit the brewing of larger beers that require a higher yeast cell count to pitch into it to make sure a full attenuation happens. And it's damn near gonna completely outlaw Hefeweizens or any other type of cloudy, berry, low flocked beer like a Belgian wit or something like that. Not to mention that tons of European styles that require natural bottle conditioning to get its carbonation and pressure I mean, that's that's impossible to make now since you're going to have live and active yeast in there, which is going to be going against this law because there's no way you're going to be able to get that effect with that little yeast. And speaking of European beers, this law is not only going to affect the beer that is being produced in India, but beer that is going to be for sale in India. And they said that when the new law goes into effect, any imports that do not meet these standards will be taken off of shelves and will not be allowed for sale. It will be illegal to buy a Hefeweizen in India, basically. But when you actually go through and read what they put out, and you know, I read the English translation, so I'm sure it's even more difficult, but the brewers were saying that it is way too vague and there's not enough clarity and it's gonna be, you know, with these guidelines, they don't even know if yeast is just going to be a limit or if yeast in the beer is gonna be considered a limit of contamination, you know, a, cr a critical, key integral part of beer making could be seen as an infection, as a contaminant in the beer that could potentially harm people. Now I'm all for, you know, uh, improving health and improving safety standards, but you gotta kinda draw a limit. It seems like this law was drafted and written by people who have absolutely zero clue about what the hell they're talking about. So the breweries, they're forming together to create a coalition to uh, go against this and try to seek clarification. 
And if they are clarified and they still are an almost impossible standard, they're going to try to rally against them and try to seek some type of change to this policy. Hopefully through the form of education, <laughs> educating the people who are writing these dumb policies and letting them know that uh, they're setting a standard that is almost impossible for them to meet. That's really weird. But speaking of contaminants in your beer, let's move back to America where people have been a little bit in a panic this week because they found out there's a bunch of chemicals in their beer. That's right. Several news agencies this week posted stories about the dangers of glyphosate being found inside of your beer. And it's not just any beer. It's tons of your big beer and it's tons of your craft beers and lots of your you know, organic beers as well. Brands like Coors, Budweiser, Sierra Nevada, Stone, New Belgium, pretty much anything you can think of probably has some glyphosate in it. Glyphosate, that's a hard word to say. Now, one reason everyone's getting a little wigged out is because this is one of the key ingredients in Monsanto's uh, weed killer known as Roundup. And if you've been following the news for any amount of years, you've probably heard that Roundup has been directly linked to a ton of cancer cases where people who've been exposed to it have developed cancer and it's pretty nasty. There's a lot of lawsuits going against it. So with news agencies getting all hyped up and alerted and scared and pushing out these stories, it kind of got people all riled up and in a panic because they don't want to drink their favorite beers and then get cancer. Now how this glyphosate is getting into beer, it's because it's going, probably used either on the crops that are used to make the beer, like the barley, the hops or whatever, or it was used in neighboring lands where it kind of got pushed down because of rain and water flow and whatnot into those fields and absorbed by the plants or it could be transferred through the air or maybe it was an old plot of land because that chemical stays in the ground for an extenuated amount of time so just because it was found in a particular brand you like doesn't mean that particular brand is supporting its use or that they use it themselves it's just the fact that when you're playing with chemicals on a large scale it's kind of hard not to cross contaminate sometimes However, with that being said, I'm also not sure why this is news and why it is getting people freaked out. I know Joke reported this exact same story back in 2017. It's not new. I mean, this is something that has been public knowledge for quite some time. So why all of a sudden it's headline breaking news? I don't know. But additionally, as said in this study, same as the last time, the levels of glyphosate, glypho, that is such a hard word, glyphs, glyph, glo, glyphosate. The levels of glyphosate found in these beers are at such a tiny level that it is practically impossible to harm you at all. In fact, a spokesman from the Wine Institute said, an adult would have to drink more than 140 glasses of wine a day, containing the highest levels of glyphosate measured just to reach the level that California's Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment has identified as a no significant risk level. So this is really pretty much a non-issue. It's not a big deal, nothing to worry about. Interesting to know, but not really that big of a deal. So uh, I just figured I should cover it because it's gotten so many headlines this week and I saw a lot of Reddit posts of people freaking out. So I figured, you know, let me do my small little part to try to get it out there that it's nothing to really freak out or worry about, you know? It's gonna be okay, promise. But continuing to talk about chemicals in beer, let us talk about beers that were announced or released this week. This week, we got news out of the beloved Natty Light. I'm sure all of you are very fond, or at least know of Natty Light. Me, it has a very, very special place in my heart. It is still my go-to jumping into the river beer you know if i'm going out with the boys to crack open a few cold ones in the woods most likely it's going to be a 30 rack and natty they announced this week that they're going to be introducing a strawberry lemonade infused natty light except it's got the greatest name of all we know about natty we know about natty light and of course who could forget the natty daddy but forget all that because i'm about to introduce to you natter day that's literally its name, Natterday. Good God, I love that name. Natterday is being described as an incredibly sessionable light lager 
infused with phenomenal lemonade and strawberry flavoring. They really hit every buzzword possible there. It's coming in under 5% ABV just in time for spring break and it will be hitting shelves already. It's already out. I've already seen reviews on it and they just announced this this week. So that's exciting. But seriously, I actually am kind of excited. I would love to get my hands on it. I know for a fact in my heart of hearts that it's got to be better than an awful lemon pledge flavored beer that Coors came out with a few summers back. That thing was awful. I know Natty's going to knock this out apart for me. I know a lot of people hate Natty, but I mean, it's, it's what I grew up on. That's what I was drinking as a kid and all the way through my teen years and in my college years, I was a Natty guy. I didn't start appreciating beer until I was already a man. But it's seriously one of the best bangs for your buck and throwing all this little delicious flavoring into it kind of got me excited. And regardless of how you feel about it, you cannot deny that they are exceptionally good at advertising and marketing. This is the best idea they've had since the Nata Lantern. So if you've given it a taste, please let me know what you thought of it. Is it worth seeking out? Was it worth the delicious hype? Because I'm actually interested. I'm actually intrigued. I really do want to try it. I'm not even lying to you. So jumping back into the news real quick, we only got a couple little tidbits, nothing too crazy, nothing too hard hitting, just a couple of interesting stories I really want to push out to y'all that happened this week. First, we are going to take a look at Utah. And we got some good beer news coming out of Utah, which is a sentence that has probably never been uttered before. Utah is one of those states where if you go to a convenience store or a grocery store, you can only buy the watered down 3.2% ABV beer. You know, the, the, the grocery store beer is what a lot of people call it. But they have passed a law, at least through their state senate. You know, it still has to go through the House of Representatives. But in their House Senate, they have approved a bill that will allow the increase of the beer up to 4.8%. So yes, while it doesn't seem like that big of a deal to raise the ABV up to that limit, which is already pretty much astronomically way, way lower than what we're seeing all across the country. I mean, even in Colorado, not too far away from Utah, we saw just this year them legalize double digit ABV beers for sale in the exact same places that Utah is fighting for. But it is a big deal for Utah because, I mean, for a quite a long time, their absolute total ABV limit has been about 4% alcohol by volume. If you were going to buy alcohol in a grocery store, a gas station, uh, even from a brewery, it has to be 4% ABV. If I'm not mistaken, if I'm mistaken, please correct me. But when I was there in 2016, 17, that was the law. And I don't think it's changed since then. And that was pretty strict. It's probably one of the worst in the entire country, if not the worst. So yes, I do think this is a absolute monumental, huge step forward for Utah. And I do really hope this works out for y'all. I'm really, really rooting for y'all. I know y'all got a lot of limits and restrictions because of the religious dominance that is in Utah. And I know that for Mormonism, it is not necessarily a positive thing to go out and be drinking, but you know, there's a whole lot of other people in your state that are non-Mormon. And because of that, I uh, don't feel like they should really be pushing even though even though it is the majority, it is still in America, and I don't think they should be pushing their religious ideologies onto the non-religious. So like I said, I'm really rooting for y'all. All it has to do to pass is it's already gone through the Senate. All it has to do is get approved in the House of Representatives. So if you are a Utahian, a Utahnite, I don't know what y'all call yourselves, but if you are one of those people living in Utah, I do highly encourage you reach out to your legal representation. I mean, that's literally what they're there for. They're to represent your political views. So I, I hope you go out and I hope you do contact them and say that you do want this. You want to see more modernized, more, less, less religiously oppressed alcohol laws. I mean, it just seems like it's, it should be your right to have that opportunity to be able to drink a beer that's, you know, stronger than what everyone else would consider baby beer. So I am praying for y'all. I guess that's a weird way to say that. I don't know. Good luck, Utah. <laughs> now this next story is a bit fucking nuts. I'm just gonna say it how it is. Two men were injured carrying a case of Corona. 
And when I say injured, I don't mean lightly injured. I mean pretty injured. Apparently, while they were carrying cases of corona, the bottles exploded spontaneously with such a force that it lacerated one of the guy's legs, spraying blood everywhere, and to the point where the glass was r rocketing up into their faces and damaging their eyes to the points where both men had to wear sunglasses during an interview. Now, a part of me feels like this story might be made up as a cash grab in order to sue Corona in order to get some pocket money. I'm just saying, it seems a bit crazy, but apparently there have been several instances of this going across the country. And apparently it comes from a manufacturing issue in the bottle where they mass produce these bottles and there are weaknesses or defect points within the bottle. So if, you know, it's already under pressure because of the carbon dioxide that's built up in order to give the beer head and carbonation, whatever. And if it's sh shook in, jostled or whatever, it could cause it to explode. My bet is a lawsuit is pending. They haven't quite dropped that bomb yet, but I got a feeling it's coming. Anyway, that's pretty much all I wanted to get to at the end of that story. So be safe out there if you're uh, a Corona drinker. You know, you, I don't want any of my subscribers losing eyes and they can't watch me and I'll lose watch time and I won't get monetized. But those are all the stories I wanted to talk about this week. Like not a crazy news week, but a lot of crazy shit happened simultaneously. It's a weird du duality. I've had a little too much whiskey. I'm having a hard time talking today. Thank you for watching, everybody. I really hope you enjoyed. Like, comment, subscribe. Remember, there is a story in every bottle and that life is beautiful. Cheers.